to another exciting episode of StraussNet Sports Radio. It is September 30th, 2024. When I last left you, it was March. It was spring training for Major League Baseball. We had our prediction show. I had Mark Strauss, my dad, on. He's been a Peoria area sports personality for a number of years. And I got his thoughts. We had my thoughts. The running gag on the show is that we're really bad about predicting things, especially the NFL. I'm really bad with the NFL. Um, I've kind of stopped trying to predict the NFL because it's so unpredictable. But we had our predictions, and now, today is the day before one of my favorite times of the sports year, the Major League Baseball postseason. We're going to get into today how that looks. We're going to try and predict it again and see who we think is going to win. And when I say we, I mean me and my buddy Tim Bradshaw, my betting expert. He'll be on our next segment. But why don't we start with where we stand right now? How do those predictions do? Where do things look um, heading into the playoffs? Who made the playoffs? What happened to the Cardinals? Because we know the Cardinals had a... um, They they signed Sonny Gray, and they had a, a plan for their rotation and their offense, and how did that go? I will tell you the caveat for this show is that the Braves and Mets are playing two games today after everybody else finished yesterday because there was... Uh, there was hurricane weather last week, and the series in Atlanta got postponed two of the three games, so they're playing two of them today, and the Diamondbacks are also involved. So they'll be playing while we are recording, and we'll let you know live how that is going and how that might affect things. So with, in terms of betting, we'll just leave that out for now, but we'll get to all that later, and we'll see... What it looks like, but let's start with let's start with how our predictions went versus the regular season standings. Let's take a look here. So I predicted that the NL East was going to be won by the Braves. Well, that didn't happen. The Braves are playing today to try to get into the wild card. I said the Cardinals were going to win the Central. I thought what they did, in, I thought a lot of bad luck happened last year, and I thought what they did with the rotation would be enough, and I thought the offense would carry them. Well, unfortunately, that didn't happen either. The St. Louis Cardinals, and I'll talk about them before we get on to our segment with Tim. The Cardinals' offense went silent this year. They had an up-and-down year. Like I said, I'll get into them later. Instead, that was the Milwaukee Brewers, who actually traded away Corbin Burns and lost their manager, Craig Council, to Chicago. They had a pretty nice year. Um, 93-win team. And I said Atlanta didn't win the East Division. I left it out. It was the Phillies, who I had as one of my playoff teams. The Phillies were your East champions. They were one of the best teams with 95 wins. They were just really good from start to finish. And in the West, we, you know, I said the Dodgers. Dad actually said the Dodgers. Um, It was the Dodgers. His other division winners were going to be Atlanta and Cincinnati. Atlanta, obviously, like I said, is vying for a wild card spot. Cincinnati did not make the playoffs. Um, I predicted... So I predicted Atlanta, St. Louis, Dodgers, and the wild cards being Philly, Arizona, and San Diego. Well, I got some of that right. I got Dodgers. The Phillies are in, but they won the division. Milwaukee won the Central. The Padres are your first National League wild card. The other two spots are currently held by Atlanta and the Mets, and Arizona is the first team out. Now here's how this works. If the Braves or the Mets sweep today, win both games, Arizona gets in and the team that loses both games today is out. But if there's a split, Atlanta and the Mets are in. So, And the reality is the f- team that wins the first game gets into the playoffs. So the, the, fa- the idea that they're going to be playing hard to sweep the series to get the other team out, it's probably just not going to be there. Like the Braves have said... Chris Sale, who they traded for from the Red Sox, who had a fantastic season, could win the Cy Young. He's slated for Game 2, the win-or-die game. If they win Game 1, they're not pitching Sale in Game 2. So they won't be trying to win Game 2, so the Mets will be playing to get into the playoffs. Conversely, Tyler McGill is pitching Game 1, and Severino's line up for Game 2. And if the Mets win game one, Severino's not going to pitch. And the Braves will be pitching sale for their lives. So Arizona is, they're in trouble because it's not likely that one of these teams is going to win both games. So right now it's Atlanta and the Mets. 
My first out teams for the National League, we did this this year. This was new. First teams not to make the playoffs. I said Cubs and Cincinnati. I agreed with my dad that Cincinnati was, um, they'd improved, but they just didn't put it together this year. The real first two are going to be whichever the Mets, Braves, and Diamondbacks don't make it. And then the Cubs and the Cardinals actually had identical records tied for second place in their division with 83 wins. Um, they said yesterday on the broadcast that the Cardinals would be in second because of tiebreakers, but MLB's listing the Cubs. I don't know. Um, it doesn't matter. So I, we then it's San Francisco and Cincinnati. So we were wrong about Cincinnati, but uh, I thought the Cubs would take a step forward. They signed Shota Imanaga. And the Cardinals, I thought, would be good. They were going 500, so an even record would have been 10 games better than last year. They're t- uh, 13, actually. Or 12, 12 games better, because they have a 5-12 winning percentage. 83 wins for the Cardinals. So they kind of did what they wanted to do, but it just they couldn't put it all together. My dad said Atlanta, Cincinnati, and the Dodgers. He, got, he might still get Atlanta in. He had Phillies, Arizona, and the Diamondbacks for his wild cards. So the Dodgers are yes, the Breds are no, Atlanta's a TBD. Phillies are yes, but in a division winner. Uh, Arizona TBD and San Diego was a yes. He had Cardinals Cubs as first out. So we both kind of had the Cardinals and Cubs as if they don't win the division, they're going to have a a tough time getting to the playoffs. And that was the case. The only team in the central division that made it was Milwaukee and they won 93 games. So they had a good year. Um, yeah. And I had Atlanta as the world series winner. He had the Dodgers, the world series winner. That's still TBD, but we've both got the national league, going to the World Series uh, as the winner at right now. As for the American League predictions, I had Baltimore winning the East. That did not happen, but it came rather close. The Yankees actually won the division. They had 94 wins. Baltimore had 91. Uh, I, he also had, My dad also had Baltimore. We actually have very similar American League. So I had Baltimore, Minnesota, and Texas winning their divisions. He had Baltimore, Minnesota, and Houston. Now, we both had Texas and Houston as a wild card if we didn't have them winning the division. The Yankees won the division. They were actually my first out and his first out. Minnesota did not make the playoffs. They were going to and had a massive collapse. Um, They won 82 games this year. They, They almost... I mean, they were in till the last week, and they just could not. They finished 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games of the season. That tells the story. They needed to get to 86 wins. Um, Texas had so many injuries this year. They lost a bunch of their pitchers. They lost, you know, Adolis Garcia didn't have the same year. Seager was in and out of the lineup. They lost Josh Lowe. They lost Josh Young. It was just, if you look at the team... And you start it over next year, you got to think, oh, they'll be better because they just had so many guys get hurt just from the beginning of the year. So we weren't necessarily wrong on them in performance sake. They did what they could with what they had, and it just wasn't good enough. Uh, he had Houston win the division. They won the division again. Um, the, the Astros seemed to be inevitable. They didn't quite have all the same pieces they did the last couple of years, and they still managed to get it done. Now, I had Houston, Toronto, and Seattle because I thought Toronto was still good, and then the Yankees and Tampa as my first out. Seattle was the first team out. My Boston Red Sox finished at 500. They had a pretty good year. They just didn't have enough pitching. Their lineup figured out uh, some things out. Uh, my my furry co-hosts are running amok right now, so if you hear bells, that's that would be the cats. Uh, so bear with that. Um, they always like to help out. They're... Not very good helpers, though. Where was I? Seattle was... They were good. They did not get everything they needed. They kind of struggled off and on. They they had 85 wins, so they finished a game out of a playoff spot. My dad had Toronto, Texas, and Seattle. So we had virtually the same teams. Baltimore, Minnesota, Texas and Houston, Toronto, and Seattle, with Yankees and Rays out. The only difference in ours was if you wanted to order up the wild card teams and the Western division. Now the American League wild cards are a little easier to talk about than the National League because the two of the three National League teams are still in play. The American League, however, did finish on time. There was no tiebreaker necessary. Like I said, Seattle finished 
a game out. They were the first out. Who made the other two wild card spots? Surely it had to be someone like, you know, Toronto or well, I said Texas didn't make it. How did Tampa do? Kansas City and Detroit. The Kansas City Royals had a great season. Bobby Witt Jr. came into his own. He's going to be up for MVP alongside Aaron Judge. It's going to be hard to see him beating Judge just because of the glory that Judge got with all the home runs that he was hitting. Um, and being a Yankee, I believe that counts for something amongst the media. There's a bias towards those big city, big market teams. But Bobby Witt Jr. had an MVP season. And the Royals actually at one point tied Cleveland for the division in August. I'll get into Kansas City a little more later. There's a betting aspect here. But the Royals had an injury to Vinny Pasquantino, and he he hurt himself, that broke his thumb. He might be back tomorrow for the wild card series. And their offense kind of struggled from that point. They actually fell down and were bouncing around with Minnesota, Detroit, um, Seattle, and Boston for a while. So there was a chance they didn't make it, but they've kind of been in the playoff mix the whole year. They are your number two wildcard team with 86 wins. But I think the team that surprises me the most uh, as the season went on would be the Tigers. They won 86 games, and they finished very strong, 7-3 and three in their last 10. They made a push while Kansas City was falling apart for a little bit, and they actually flipped in to the wildcard spot. The team that suffered ended up being the Twins. The, they always say the postseason's about getting hot at the right time. Well... The the Royals and the Twins both got cold kind of at the wrong time, but the, the Twins got cold at the worst time. They got cold the last two weeks, and that's why they end up out. So Kansas City, they actually they make it in, and they're hoping for a nice run. They'll have to play Baltimore in the first round. They will go to Baltimore. Detroit will play at Houston in the, the wild card series. The reason I bring up the Royals, it's interesting, and I'll bring this back up with Tim when he's on in our next segment. The Kansas City Royals were one of his um, dark horse teams to win a division. He said they're young, they're good, they added pieces like Lugo and Waka at the deadline, and he thought they were going to win the division. Um, I said I thought Detroit was a little further along than Kansas City, and as it turns out, we were both right because they finished with the exact same record. They didn't win the division. Cleveland still hung on, even with their new manager. Um, they probably just have a couple more pieces, but I don't think that means that they're necessarily going to be worlds better than either of those two teams in the playoffs because the playoffs, anything can happen. But Kansas City makes it in. Tim was completely right about that, uh, that he they would be a playoff team. He was not on our prediction show, but I did talk to him about some of the over-unders and the betting aspect before the season, and he was big on Kansas City. So Kansas City, Detroit, Baltimore in reverse order, or uh, Baltimore, Kansas City, and Detroit in order are your wild cards. So that sets up a postseason bracket that looks like this. The Astros will host Detroit. The Orioles will host Kansas City. That all starts tomorrow. The winners of those, the... Houston-Detroit series will play the Cleveland Guardians in the division series, and Kansas City and Baltimore will play the New York Yankees. As someone who is pulling for Kansas City, and again, I'll tell you why in our betting segment, hint, hint, I don't know if uh, I would rather play the Yankees or the uh, Guardians. I know it'll be a fun series to watch if they were to advance, or Oriole, you know, it kind of stays in division um, for some of it, but... Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens on the National League side. Again, the wild cards aren't entirely set. The Brewers will host and the Padres will host and they'll play the winners of, um, the Braves, the Mets and the Diamondbacks. I like San Diego again for a betting aspect. Hint, hint. I like San Diego better than all the teams in the wild card round. I think Milwaukee's good. I don't want to doubt them, but what happened last year to them with, uh, playing against uh, Arizona, who eventually went to the World Series, I think it's kind of the same situation. The Brewers won a division that was mediocre. I think they're a decent team. I think their manager's good. I'm not trying to knock them. But the Mets and Braves, aside from the having to pitch guys today aspect, the Mets and Braves are on a roll right now, even though the Braves had to, again, rebuild their entire team. 
uh, their entire outfield. I think they're battle-tested right now, and the Brewers haven't really been having a fight lately. I could be completely wrong. I could be way off base on this. But I just think whoever the Brewers end up playing, is they're going to have a little bit of an advantage. I know the Diamondbacks haven't played that great lately, so if they end up playing the Diamondbacks, that could be a completely different scenario as well. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. But Brewers, Padres, I think the Padres are a division-winning caliber team. I think they are a pennant-winning caliber team. The winner of the Padres series will play the Dodgers, and I think the Padres can beat the Dodgers. The Dodgers actually beat up on the Padres this past week in a battle that could have sent San Diego to a division title, but the Dodgers ended up winning a couple of those, and that put that to rest. The Brewers will series will face the Phillies, who have been in the World Series two years ago and then were one win away from the World Series last year. So I think the National League side has a lot more, I'll use the word experience, that it's not necessarily uh, the emotion that I'm trying to convey, but there's a lot more playoff level looking teams, teams that we know what to expect. I think there's, we know more what to expect out of the National League, ironically, even though we don't know all the teams yet, because we have the Padres, the Dodgers, the Brewers, the Braves, um, the Diamondbacks are involved right now, and then potentially uh, a hot Mets team. These are all teams that have been around the last few years in the playoffs. You know, Padres were in a couple of years ago in 22. Uh, they weren't last year, but Mike Schilt, former Cardinal manager, has them ready to roll. While the American League, you know, the Orioles got in last year, but they weren't quite they weren't quite the team that people hoped they would be, and their rotation's a little banged up. They have Corbin Burns, they have the ace, they have Eflin, but the rest of their rotation's banged up, so it's hard to say what to expect from them. Kansas City and Detroit are both teams that made their way in after 100 lost seasons. They're not the teams that we saw last time Kansas City and Detroit were in. Uh, Detroit's in the playoffs for the first time since 2014, and the Royals... First time since they won the World Series in 2015. Meanwhile, the Astros, even though they have a few players, it looks a little different. The Astros keep on Astroing. Um, and at this point, yeah, the cheating scandal was there that marred this run, but I've given them credit on this show time and time again. I also am so sick of them, but you got to give them credit at this point. The Astros are a good team, they're well run, they know how to win. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens when that core ages out, but right now the Astros are part of it, and even though they have to play in the wild card series, they're a division winner, and they are a threat till someone knocks them off. You know, until we have a season with no Astros in the playoffs, they are a World Series contender in my book. And now they'll go up against a Cleveland team that's played pretty well. Um, I really like the Yankees in this side of the bracket right now. Forget whatever I'm going to tell you I'm uh, betting on later. Right now, if you're not talking about betting, if you're talking about who do I like, I really like the Yankees. I think their rotation's pretty healthy. I think they're in a really good place right now. Um, I like Baltimore, but their pitching scares me. Cleveland seems to find ways to fail, but I actually believe in them on that side of the bracket. I think they could beat somebody like Houston. But again, the Royals in Detroit are going to have something to say about this, so we'll see how the wild card goes. On the National League side, really any of those teams that are already in, the division winners and the Padres, I could see all of them. Now, I like the Padres better than the Dodgers. The Dodgers rotation's a mess. They acquired Jack Flaherty at the deadline, who I'm thrilled to see pitching well. But after that, it's really hard to say who's going to be in their rotation. You know, Kershaw's not there. Bueller's not been the same. Glass now might be done for the year. Um, I believe he is. Yamamoto's there. They signed Yamamoto. How is he going to do in the playoffs? Padres have a rotation. Brewers have a rotation. Phillies have a rotation. So as good as the Dodgers are, it's going to be very interesting to see who comes out of that side. I like the Padres the best, but they have to play that extra series. So um, we'll see what happens with the National League side. Let's talk about the St. Louis Cardinals for a moment. And we'll wrap this segment up and come back with Tim. The St. Louis Cardinals last year finished with a losing season, and the thought was, well, they have to do better this year. Well, the front office felt like there were a couple of Band-Aid fixes that would solve the problems. The main thing they said was they needed pitchers who would eat innings. So they signed 
First, Lance Lynn, former Cardinal, and uh, Kyle Gibson. Now, those turned out to be okay signings. Um, I liked the Lynn signing. I thought he could bounce back to being a more high-end pitcher. He got banged up during the year. Kyle Gibson actually was pretty steady throughout the season. Let's take a look at what Kyle Gibson's and Lance Lynn's stats were. Let's just take a look at that, and that will tell us how some of these signings went. But the big addition was Sonny Gray. They went out and got from the Minnesota Twins. They signed him to a, con- uh, a three-year contract, Sonny Gray, and I thought this would be the move that put them over the, the hump. Sonny Gray was going to be the ace, the ace that they've needed for a while. He pitched to a tune of 13-9 and with a 3.84 ERA. He struck out 203 batters, 109 whip. He uh, pitched in 28 games. He did fine. Sonny Gray is not what you'd consider a super elite ace. He is a very, very good pitcher. He is a. There's a lot of people who said he was a number two, more like. I'd say he's a number one, but in an elite team's rotation. Like, if you put him back on the Yankees, he used to pitch for the Yankees at one point, it'd be Garrett Cole and then Sonny Gray. I think that's how you want to line him up. But I thought, you know, for this Cardinal team, from what they were two years ago in 2022, they didn't have anybody as good as Sonny Gray in 22. You know, if you add Sonny Gray and put Jordan Montgomery back on the team, you have a pretty darn good uh, one-two punch in your rotation. But they didn't. They decided, you know, this is the route we're going. Um, we're going to go innings eaters. Lance Lynn, who pitched as the number two, he was 7-4 and four with a 3.84 ERA. Struck out 109, 1.34 whip, 23 games uh, pitched in. I believe he started all of those. It, Kyle Gibson... He had a 4.24 ERA, so his was a little bloated. He was 8-8, eight eight, um, pitched 169 two-thirds innings, 151 strikeouts, 1.35 whip, so he was fine. Miles Michaelis was the was the uh, next starter in that rotation, then Steven Matz, who got hurt. Eventually, Andre Pallante entered the fray, guy who they've used as a spot starter. He turned in a 3.78 ERA, won eight games, uh, 1.3 whip. So he actually turned into one of the most reliable starters for them. They end up trading the White Sox for Eric Fetty. They sent out Tommy Edmond, who got hurt to start the year and never really recovered until he was traded. Then the Dodgers got him going. Fetty ended the season with a 3.3 ERA, uh, 1.16 whip. Let's find what he did for just the Cardinals. He had a 3.72 ERA for the Cardinals. Um won two games and he's under contract for next year so he will he will be there where things went awry wasn't so much the rotation it wasn't the bullpen um ryan helsley actually set the the record for cardinals single season saves with 49 he was one short of the 50 trevor rosenthal had 48 back in 2015 they added uh, you know, they had JoJo Romero, they had Andrew Kittredge, and those three guys were really like one of the best bullpen trios in baseball this year. Like they led the league in holds, saves. Um, you know, uh, Helsley went to the All Star game. Uh, anecdotally, he didn't pitch in the All Star game to save some bullets. You know, to rest. It was the lineup. The lineup went south. Paul Goldschmidt didn't have his normal season. He hit two forty five with twenty two home runs. Um, only 65 RBI, and Nolan Arenado seemed like, you know, maybe he was nursing an injury in the first half. I don't know if a lot of other people believe that, but he looked stiff. His defensive play wasn't that good early on. And then, you know, his stats, he only hit 16 home runs. He hit 272, but he only hit 16 home runs. That's That was alarming. So we spent most of the year without the, they spent most of the year without their three, four hitters, um, you know, guys like Alec Burleson, he was the guy who really helped lead the charge uh, early in the season. Mason Wynn had a great season. Burleson ended up with 21 home runs. Uh, Wynn hit a few. Wynn ended up being the leadoff man. And there's a big name I haven't mentioned yet, and that is Wilson Contreras. Wilson Contreras had another season to forget. If you remember last year, Contreras had that whole thing where he wasn't. They there was some sort of disagreement with the pitchers. And they tried to scapegoat him for their pitching issues, and they took him out of the catcher's spot. They put him back in. Contreras wasn't the issue. He hit 262 with 15 home runs this year. 
but it, he only had 300 at bats. I mean, he got hit on the forearm. The so the Cardinals coaching staff told him move up on the plate when you're catching to try to steal some strikes. A lot of catchers around the league are doing this now. It, that's my understanding. And J.D. Martinez, and it wasn't on purpose, swung and actually hit Wilson Contreras in the forearm and broke his arm, and he was out a couple months. And he got back faster than a lot of people thought they could that he could. And then later he got hurt again, and it ended his season early. So Wilson Contreras had a lost season. The best part of the Cardinals' season, uh, Mother's Day through the trade deadline, um, they actually started falling apart right before the trade deadline, right around the All-Star break. But the best part of their season, late May, June, July, they were hitting win first, uh, Burleson second, Contreras third, and then they would get to Arenado and Goldschmidt. And Brendan Donovan hit fourth sometimes this year, and he's not that type of hitter. Uh, Jordan Walker got sent down for almost the entire season due to some hitting mechanic issues. He wasn't hitting. like He was hitting under 200. Um, they were tinkering with a swing, which I don't necessarily agree with, but he came back up late in the season and started hitting and said that he was being stubborn about some of that coaching and that once he just let it happen, it kind of took and he, he was hitting well again. So I don't know what to say there. All in all, I think the Cardinals were mishandled this year. I still don't love their coaching staff. Um, I still think to a degree they're too reliant in the dugout on the analytics aspect where, you know, the manual says, do this. If this exact situation comes up, just do this. Don't think about it, just do it. Now, Oliver Marmol says he writes the lineup. It's not the front office. It's not the analytics book. He makes the decisions. I don't know. I think the fact that this is a discussion is a problem. Like, it shouldn't be a discussion. Good teams don't have this problem. Mike Schilt managed the team and then got fired because he didn't do it the way the front office and the analytics team want him to do it. And now I just said the Padres might be my favorite team to go to the World Series in the National League. Even though they're a wild card behind the uh, Dodgers, I still like how the Nationals are playing, how they're being managed. So I think there's something to be said for how the Cardinals' coaching and game planning departments are running things. As for the front office, you know, the move to trade off Tommy Edmond at the time was like, okay, we could make the playoffs. So we're going to trade for this starter, and we're going to trade this guy who hasn't played for us all year. In hindsight, I think I'd rather have the extra year of Tommy Edmond, who's a free agent after next year, and let some of these young pitchers pitch rather than Eric Fetty being in the rotation. No disrespect to Fetty. And I think he was a good addition in a vacuum. But there's we're at a crossroads, and it's been talked about in the media, and they're even going to have a press conference today. There's a lot of people saying, well, the Cardinals need to stop signing these patchwork contracts and worrying about the universal this year, not just 2024. That they need to kind of tear some of it down, get rid of some of the older players, and let the young guys play and kind of reset. My concern with this is we haven't seen them go all out to spend in the last few years. You know, their big acquisition a couple years ago was um, Albert Pujols for a year. They had Paul Goldschmidt, who they did re-sign. They got Arenado, but he got paid a lot of that money by the Rockies. The Rockies paid to send him over here. So they haven't gone all out. They went and signed Gray when they said they were going to sign three high-end starting pitchers, and they got a couple other guys who were good, but they never went after. They didn't re-sign Jordan Montgomery or Jack Flaherty and then get Sonny Gray. They got Sonny Gray and then Lance Lynn, who was a bounce-back project, and Kyle Gibson, who was a good pitcher, a reliable pitcher for them, but he is what he is. Um, They went and got Eric Fetty. Lynn, Fetty, and Gibson are all the same kind of pitcher at this point in their careers. So, you know, we saw Michael McGreevy have a great finish to the season. Andre Pallante, we'll see Quinn Matthews coming. So, yeah, there are some young players coming. As for the, you know, the offense... Burleson, Walker, will Newt Bar ever stay healthy enough to matter? Um, Dylan Carlson was traded. Dylan Carlson was part of a deal to get a reliever from the, the Tampa Bay Rays, and they didn't even keep the reliever. They just decided it's time to move on. So there's some like, we'll do this, but not that. 
Here's my problem with blowing it up and starting over. Here's a team who hasn't spent in the last few years, like really gone out and spent. And some of it's because of TV contracts, some of it's from the, the COVID shortened season with no fans. What says they're going to go back to spending at this level again? Even this level, because their payroll is a decent, they have a decent payroll. They're like eighth in baseball, I think, but they're just not choosing to spend it wisely. My concern is it's not like the Blues where they have salary cap implications, and when they get that salary cap opened up, they're going to go and get some new players to go with the young guys they're, they're grooming. What happens to the Cardinals is they don't have, they have a soft cap with the luxury tax. So what happens when that soft, uh, when that um, that salary is uh, the the payroll? When the payroll is lowered, what happens? Will they be comfy? Will they say, "Well, we're just doing this with young guys and it's working," and not bring in the next Holiday or Goldschmidt or Arenado? Or are they being truthful? Will they eventually go back out and get uh, some veterans, some some pop, not necessarily just in the offensive category, but some payroll pop. Will they go back out and get a high-end player? I know they've never been huge in the the super free agency talks. They like to trade for guys like that and then re-sign them. I don't know. I just and there's some front office changing going on. Supposedly today they're gonna have a press conference where they announce that Heim Bloom, the former Red Sox GM, is going to become the new director of player development, and they're gonna revamp the the player development system. Um, that means Randy Flores will stay put and John Mazalock, who's gotten a lot of heat and I don't know how much is or isn't, um, due to him. Uh, but he's not as transparent as Doug Armstrong is with the blues. And I think that's some of the problem. They're not good at PR. They're not good at telling the fans what's going on. John Mazalock says he's going to step down after, or at least move into a different role after the 25 season when that contract's up. So at least next year, everything's kind of going to remain the same in terms of the front office for the major league system. Paul Goldschmidt, they've announced that he will not be back. He's They're going to part ways with him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, in my opinion, that there's zero chance that he comes back. You know, if something doesn't go right, maybe they could look into a cheap deal with him. But that's just that's likely wishful thinking. They announced they're going to part ways with Paul Goldschmidt and he will become an unrestricted free agent. So supposedly no qualifying offer to get any sort of compensation for him. Uh, it sounds like they either want Burleson to play first base, which I'd be comfortable with. A lot of people think Walker's going to play first. Burleson's actually become a decent outfielder. Walker's not. But we haven't seen Walker over there. He is a natural third baseman, so maybe he can play first. They haven't said what the plan is at this moment. You know, maybe it's Burleson there and Walker DHing. I don't know how comfortable Walker is DHing. I know Burleson, someone gave me the stats this year that he's actually better as a fielder when he hits than he's not as good DHing. And some guys just can't do it. Adam Dunn couldn't do it. He they signed him with the White Sox and he just couldn't do it. So we'll see how the offense is next year. But if they're parting with Paul Goldschmidt, there is also a rumor that they could be open to offers for Sonny Gray. So we're talking about walking the pitching staff back that they just built. They just put the guy who should be their ace in there. Now, does that mean they're trying to get rid of him or they're open to the right offer? Don't know. Uh, They did backload his deal, so they didn't pay him that much this year. So maybe they are being cheap. Or maybe they really are just open to seeing what's out there. There's others speculating after Ryan Helsley's season, he only has one year left on his contract, Maybe you trade Helsley at his best. Who becomes a closer? Is it Jojo Romero? Um, Andrew Kittredge, I think, is a free agent. So what do you do there? Uh, I didn't think Ryan Fernandez was that exciting. They got him, as I think, as a Rule 5 from the Red Sox. He was good, but I wouldn't say he's a closer. And then what happens with Contreras, Arenado? There's already people on uh, formerly Twitter, now X, fans and writers, bloggers saying... Well, they could just clean a house. They could dump Arenado somewhere. They can and just play, you know, somebody like Gorman or Sajasi every day. They could move, you know, they're letting Goldschmidt go. They could move Gray. They could move Helsley. You know, do you just get rid of everybody who's older and let all the young kids come in? I don't know. I disagree with that. I think you can do both. 
I think you can say, all right, we're 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 going to do a little bit of a step back and hopefully it'll give us a step forward. I think you keep Sonny Gray, especially to help teach some of these other guys. And they weren't that far off from a playoff spot. By the way, I mean, the offense was a problem. What says you can't go get a guy like Brent Rooker from Oakland or now whatever they're going to be, the Athletics, who played their final season in Oakland. What says you can't go get a Brent Rooker type guy, stick him in the middle of the lineup, let some of these young pitchers take over and go like Sonny Gray, Fetty, Palante, you know, Quinn Matthews is coming, McGreevy, not to mention you still have Michaelis and Mats, who I they still have some term on their contract, but you could see if someone would take that to get them off the roster. You could eventually, you could release them. You could just leave them in there because eventually someone's going to get hurt and you need depth. I don't think the Cardinals are that far off from a playoff spot, but... Because they had they had a good two thirds of the year, they had a good third of the year. They were just bad in the first third and bad in the last third. And someone out there probably thinks I'm crazy because like, well, this is what you said about this past season, and they patched it up and kept going. Yeah, but I'm talking about making a major improvement. They improved the pitching staff, and it worked. The pitching was fine. It wasn't stupendous, but it was it was fine. If you go out and get a big bat to go with everyone. Or status quo and let some of these young guys come up and perform. But I don't think you have to dump players. I think having a Nolan Arenado is a good thing. And I think later in the season, as you know, he was very frustrated early in the season. He talked about how he was in his own head. That's how frustrated he was. But when he sort of gave up and decided, okay, I'm going to help mentor some of these young guys. And if I can't succeed, at least maybe they can. And then he started hitting and feeling better. So if Nolan Arenado has transitioned mentally... What says that you have a Sonny Gray, a Nolan Arenado, a Wilson Contreras? What says these guys can't help you? I think that they can keep a lot of these players and, you know, maybe go get somebody or kind of like the Blues did. Trim the fat, keep some of the key pieces, and let the young guys kind of start pushing those guys to the side. Example, Braden Shen is the captain of the Blues. He's one of the guys, they signed him to an extension. He's still there. They didn't try to move him. But he's also not in the same top six type role. He might play on their, one of their top two lines, but he's not the focal point of the offense anymore. He has roles. Well, keep Nolan Arenado. He can still be your three or four hitter. And as you start grooming some of these young guys, as they come up and they start having success, you can push him aside and he's not as prominent. I still think Nolan Arenado has a lot to give. I think Goldschmidt does. There's teams like the Brewers and the Astros who could be interested in him. So I think it's a little bit of an overreaction if you're the Cardinals to say, well, we're going to tank. Because I don't think teams that are already stingy decide all of a sudden, well, we're going to spend a bunch now. So it worries me if the Cardinals are tanking. The reality might be they might shop Sonny Gray. I don't know that they're going to shop Nolan Arenado. I think he has a reasonable deal. He's a good third baseman still maybe in a year, but my instincts tell me, and I could be dead wrong and it could be wishful thinking, that we're going to see something somewhere in the middle. Maybe somebody gets traded who you don't want to see him trade. Maybe it's Eric Fetty. He has a year left and he's a reliable starting pitcher and that would get some of these other guys into the rotation. I think they're going to be similar to this year, next year, in 25, but it'll be more about the young players. So... The Cardinals kind of have me frustrated. I think, you know, they should look at the model for the Royals or what the Red Sox are trying to do. The their, the Red Sox really kind of took steps back to take steps forward, and it's sort of working, but they need some, they need some pitching. The Royals have Bobby Witt and some of these other young guys, but they went out and they, you know, they still got Sal Perez. They went out and got Seth Lugo and Michael Wacha because they were ready to compete. So I think that's a good model for the Cardinals to look at and say, Mason wins a young player for us. Uh, he's a stud. Um, Jordan Walker needs to play. Alec Burleson proved that he deserves playing time. He was kind of inconsistent in 23, but in 24, I know he had a bad second half, but Alec Burleson's part of it. I don't know what Newt Bar is at this point. I, I like Lars Newt Bar. Um, I go round and round about this. Lars Newtbar is an analytics darling. His contact, his hard hit rate, everything is great. But then you look at the traditional stats, 
and how many games he's been able to play, and it's just not there. I think he's capable of breaking out, but when is it going to happen? If it doesn't happen next year, I don't know if it's going to happen. So that's my thoughts on the Cardinals. I'm disappointed because they kind of had the season a lot of people thought they would. They got to 83 wins. They weren't that far off of a playoff spot in all reality, but it just wasn't good enough. And I don't think blowing it up is the answer, but a lot of people apparently do. I mean, I'm just not one of them. I I understand the logic of, oh, it's not working passionate year to year. We need to let the young guys take over and kind of revamp it. And that's it's so let's let's go back to 2008. The 2016 wins, the 2017 2007 team is a disaster. 2008 they do trim some of that fat. They get rid of Jim Edmonds, they move Scott Rowland for a year of Troy Gloss. But they didn't dump ever like they have Troy Gloss who's a veteran. They still have Pujols obviously who was the greatest player on the planet. Um they still have a couple of veteran guys. In 2009, they in, they end up adding to that, and they're a little bit better. Uh, they end up getting Matt Holiday. You know, is that what we're looking at? Are we looking at doing the 20, 2008 team again? I keep saying 20 because we're so used to the 2010s and the 2020s. Are we looking at the 2008-2009 type of thing? Because that led to the 2011 World Series. So I think if they're saying we're going to take a step back and let some of the young guys get integrated into this roster, that's fine. I don't want to see them blow it up and sell off Sonny Gray, who's on a fairly reasonable contract. Nolan Arenado, who's still a centerpiece of the team, in my opinion. You know, he picked it up late in the year. I think he can still be that. Uh, Wilson Contreras, who clearly, uh, in the best part of the season, they had Burleson and Contreras 2-3. So I don't think you blow the team up. I think you maybe are open to possibilities, I'm okay with taking a step back, but I don't think you blow it up. So that's the state of the Cardinals, at least before this 2 p.m. press conference. I'm recording in the morning, and Tim will be with us later. Uh, maybe we'll get some of those details in our later segment. Um, we'll see what happens. But the Cardinals are going to be in an interesting spot. The other thing that's going on with them is that you know, ticket sales were obviously down as the year went on, and ownership kind of laughed it off, like, well, if we're not getting ticket sales, we can't spend any of the money that we don't have. And that didn't sit well with the fans, and a couple of media members said they agree with the fans, a couple of media members said they agree with ownership. You know, what happens in spring training? What kind of crowds are you getting? Spring training is interesting because people like to go down there for the beach and stuff too. So, but what happens with opening day? I usually go to opening day, I might, I might not next year, but I'm definitely going to be looking to see if tickets are a little cheaper. So, you know, I love my Cardinals. I absolutely love them. They are a huge part of my life, short of family and my wife, obviously, which I include in family. But it really hurt yesterday seeing them be knocked out for a second year in a row. The, you know, the bottom line is a lot of people have been saying this online. They haven't won a playoff game since 2020. They haven't won a playoff series since 2019. They get back to the playoffs in 2019 after having a couple years uh, where they weren't quite as good. They almost made the playoffs but didn't. Kind of like this year. The 16 and 17 teams were a lot like this year where they just weren't quite good enough. They weren't bad teams. They win the division series against the Braves. in. They win the division and the division series against the Braves in 2019 get swept by a hot wild card Nationals team who wins the World Series. In 2020, um, they kind of took a step backwards by trading uh, by letting Marcelo Zuna walk and hoping that some of the young guys could fill voids. And we don't know what that season would have been like. We don't know if they would have added someone. There was talk about Nolan Arenado that season. Um, but that was obviously the two-month season. They win the first game of the wild card series in San Diego and then lose a back-and-forth Game 2 and just get shut down in Game 3. Uh, 2021, they get Arenado, and they have to make a wild comeback in the regular season to even make the wild card game and lose an extra innings to the Dodgers. They, they went to the playoffs in 22. Albert Pujols heated up, and they were one of the best teams. A lot of people thought they would you know, be a World Series contender, but they run into the hot Phillies team and... 
in the wild card series. They lose in two games at Bush Stadium, and then they are a losing team in 23, and they're not a playoff team here in 24. And a lot of people are okay with Goldschmidt and Arenado potentially going because they've they've not done anything. They haven't won a playoff game since they acquired Arenado in 21. They lost both wild card game and series in 21 and 22 and have not been able to make it back. Now, I don't know if that's fair because, you know, it was a one game playoff in 21. What happens if they go to the division series? Um, I know it's a what if, but what happens if they win that one game and go to the division series in 21? What happens in 22 if, you know, they don't pull Quintana early or they don't blow the wild card game uh, they, they don't blow that game in, in uh, the ninth inning with Helsley on the mound and his hand was cramping or whatever it was. Tommy Edmonds able to get to the ball that could have been a big out. What what if they don't lose game one of the wild card series to the Phillies? Maybe they still lose game two. Maybe they win game three. We don't know. So you can choose to believe the Cardinals were on the cusp of still being a competitive team over the last couple of years, forgetting last year because it was a disaster. Or you can believe, yeah, the patchwork, taking it year to year, isn't working. Like I said, I think it's somewhere in the middle. The Cardinals' two problems are their PR and indecisiveness. There are people saying this year, they don't know whether they want to go in the direction of, yeah, all in, let's win, or... No, let's let the young guys play. So I guess at least a direction is good. I still think they can, in a way, do both. Again, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'm part of the problem, that I want to see them stay competitive, but I don't really want to see them compete. I do want to see them compete. I just still believe in guys like Arenado. So, again, maybe the route is keep guys like Arenado, but be willing to move other pieces. So there's the Cardinals. Um, talked about the postseason in this segment. When we come back, there should be some baseball start. Again, I'm recording this uh, podcast in two segments, same day. Still going to be the 30th of September. We'll let you know how the Braves-Mets game's going. That is, that's in Atlanta, both of them, obviously. When I come back, Tim Bradshaw will be with me, my betting expert, and we will talk about who we have taken I don't know if he's taking anyone, honestly. This is going to be news to me. Um, who we have taken in the playoffs and who we think now we should take in the playoffs. And we'll get into some of those numbers when we come back. You're listening to StraussNet Sports Radio. Welcome back to StraussNet Sports Radio. In our first segment, we talked about who is going to the postseason minus a couple of teams. And there is some news on that. Uh, first news is that the Cardinals had their end of year press conference and Heim Bloom, formerly with the Red Sox, he was with the Cardinals this year, kind of overseeing some things. Well, he is going to be moving into John Mazalock's role after the 2025 season. Mazalock has one year left. The president of baseball operations will be Heim Bloom. Um, this this coming season, he's supposedly going to be helping revamp the development system. And then I don't know what that means for Michael Gersh, who's the quote-unquote GM, but we know John Mazalak runs everything right now. So we'll see how that unfolds. I don't think this is a bad move. The The Red Sox didn't let Bloom spend any money, although the Cardinals right now don't look like they're necessarily going to be any better. I kind of talked about that earlier. What does scaling payroll back look like in terms of walking it back so you can walk it forward? But that's the news for that. The bigger news immediately is we have a doubleheader today. The Mets at the Braves, talked about that earlier, how there was rainouts due to the hurricane, and I kind of set it up, but I'll set it up again because we do have a final in Game 1. If the teams split, they both go to the playoffs. Their magic numbers are 1. They just have to win a game. For the Diamondbacks to go, one team has to win both games, thus eliminating the team that got swept today. In a wild game, the Mets won 8-7. to seven. This started off with Atlanta getting a two-run lead in the second inning and turning into a three-run inning in the sixth inning. So heading to the eighth inning, they were up 3 to nothing. Uh, the pitchers there were Schwellenbach, who was dealing, and Taylor McGill. Then the eighth inning happened. 
let's go to the scoring on my MLB app and fast forward to the eighth. I'm just doing the scoring plays. Francisco Alvarez doubles Ramon Laureano, uh, to Ramon Laureano. Tyrone Taylor scores three to one Braves. Francisco Lindor of the Mets singles and Alvarez scores. Starling Marte to second, three to two Braves. Jose Iglesias singles. Marte scores, three to three tie. Mark Vientos sack fly, four to three Mets. Nimmo homers, Iglesias scores, six to three Mets. But wait, there's more. Bottom of the eighth, Jared Kelenic singles. Eli White scores, six to four Mets. Albies doubles, six, seven to six Mets as Whit Merrifield and Michael Harris scored. So now the Braves have the lead again. But then the ninth inning, Francisco Lindor homers, Starling Marte scores, eight to seven Mets. That was two innings. It was wild. We were like kind of watching the stat tracker here. And it's just like, oh, okay, uh, this is crazy. And then I put on the TV for a minute and then the Mets scored again. And so the Mets win eight to seven. The Mets are in the playoffs and the Braves and the Diamondbacks are the only two left. The Braves will probably be pitching Chris Sale in Game 2. Actually, while I'm at it, let me see if I have a lineup yet. Because I, I don't remember what time they're starting Game 2 or if it's just going to start coming up. Uh, 4.40 is expected time, and it'll probably be Chris Sale. Not sure who the Mets are going to send out there. Um, they haven't announced. Obviously, it was kind of a, that situation for both teams where if it's not a sweep, we'll see what happens. But I'm going to guess that Chris Sale is starting to save the Braves season. If they win, they are in. Diamondbacks are out. If the Mets win game two as well, the Diamondbacks are in. So that's uh, that's definitely some news. I'm not sure if it's set who's playing where. In I don't know if um, that's going to affect the uh, the matchup for tomorrow in the wild card series. MLB has not posted that. They have posted that the Mets have clinched, but they have not posted who's who's playing the Padres or the Brewers tomorrow. So when I say we, I actually mean me and one of my co-hosts, Tim Bradshaw. Hello, how are we doing today? Good to hear from you. Good to have you. You missed the opening show, the spring training show. We had my dad, Mark Strauss, on. That's where we did our predictions, and we were very similar. But I did get some information from you later that... I've shared, and today you get the hot seat, and we are going to talk about betting. Um, I'm going to throw you a curveball, though. We talked about, we kind of pre-scripted what some of the stuff we're going to talk about, but I did forget. One of the big things you and I talked about this season was over-unders and wins. And just off the top of your head, what are some of the highlights of that that you took, some of the things you told me, and then obviously, you know, what worked out and what didn't? Uh, well, um Actually, in uh, it was it was a good season. Um, ultimately, um, came out ahead. Uh, there were uh, a couple, you know, a couple that uh, one that I got barely wrong, one I was way off on, and then um, I actually hit some home runs. Um, I was excited about. Uh, I basically made the joke um, that uh, someone should just go ahead and put their mortgage on the White Sox team total under of sixty three and a half, and. Uh, uh, I wish I, but I, I'm a sensible human. I'm never going to do something like that. Um, you know, I'm happy with the results and how much I won, but it wasn't even close to a mortgage. Um, anyways, that was, that was a, a good one. The one I'm most proud of, uh, is the Kansas city Royals. I actually, uh, I took their team total, uh, over, uh, 73 and a half wins for the season. Um, and I actually threw a little bit on them and the Tigers, to win the central division and that would have been huge um if that would have came through and one of my proudest moments um but looking back um it's one of those little things where it's like if only i would have just taken both of them to make the playoffs instead i would have been 2-0 and instead of 0-2 um but still um i'm happy with that result um the miami marlins did not come close to winning 679 games so that under was uh was also uh, very, very, um, very good. And uh, I know I'm missing something somewhere. The Padres, I took them to make the playoffs. 
and uh, I took their team total win over. You and I were sweating out the Colorado Rockies. Uh, that's the one I'm getting to because it's kind of funny how that all played out. Um, the Houston Astros had their team total over uh, over 91 and a half, and uh, I did not. Uh, I was way off on that one. Um, honestly, and I, I, to look at that, looking back on that, I wasn't way off. If they just could have played, they were horrible at the beginning of the season. And if they could have just played a little bit better, I actually would have hit that. Um, but did you take, did you take the Yankees under a hundred wins? No, I did not take them under a hundred wins. Um, I wasted a little bit of money on them not to make the playoffs. And then they ended up being the best team in the American league. Um, I told you before the season, like if you ever see a team under a hundred wins, it's like, that's. That's probably a good one to take the under on because it's really easy to. It's hard to win a hundred games, so it's really easy to hit on under a hundred wins. Well, and there were several teams: Atlanta, Dodgers, and uh, and the uh, Yankees that anybody could have cashed. Uh, all three of those would have cashed. Um, but probably the, uh, you know, the, I'm talking about positive things here, and and ultimately I am in the positive. But the one that was the most heartbreaking, and it's kind of uh, ironic because I am a Cardinal fan. Um, I took the uh, Colorado Rockies under 60 and a half wins for the season. Um, and they were at 60 wins with six games left. So they needed to lose all six games. And they proceeded to go one in five. I wondered what happened at the, yep. at the last weekend. I watched my St. Louis Cardinals um, beat them in the first two games of the series and then blow a, I believe, five to one lead. Um, then after they blew the lead, they came back and took the lead again, only to blow the lead and lose to the Rockies. And then I got to proceed to watch the Dodgers win all three games to where I lost that by one game, and it was my team blowing two different leads, which sums up their season for me to lose that play. Well, and we talked about the Cardinals too, about the over under. Um, now, I used FanDuel. We are not, I will, uh, there's two things I'd like to preface on this segment. Um, we are not condoning uh, aggressive, addictive gambling. We both run this sort of like a business where if it makes sense, and I refer to it as play money, where it's like, oh, this is, you know, if I was going to go out and buy a hat or whatever, where I was going to use it for something fun anyway. I'm not using anything that I need. Tim has a whole separate. Uh, set up so all of his, you know, his real finances get taken care of. This ha- that money and this money never touch. So we are not condoning any sort of um, irresponsible gambling. The other is that we are not sponsored on this show. Um, I mentioned that I use FanDuel. I've used MGM because Yahoo uses that. Uh, he has a couple different. We're probably going to have you look at Circa, and I will look at FanDuel so we can do some number comparisons. Uh, my wife has used. Um, I don't know. Yeah, my wife has used DraftKings. Uh, we've looked at MGM before. So we are not sponsored. We are not using one particular service because someone is paying us to. No one is paying us for any of this show. So I just want that to be clear. So in case anyone questions, uh, has any questions about how we get our information, this is totally independent, and we are just choosing to use certain services. The um, reason I use FanDuel is because they have it down at the Paradise Boat in East Peoria. So... I look on that website because I can physically go in there and do that. And Tim does some things online. Um, so this is not a sponsored segment. Now, having said all that, when uh, the season started, we were talking about different over-unders, and I said Cardinals 85 wins. Well, I thought they could clear that. My dad reminded me that if they went 500 this year, that would be a 10-win improvement from last year, and that's a lot. They actually improved by 12. So they actually they had a good season. It just you just don't think about that we really really won the playoffs because of last year. They won 83 games. They were three wins from clearing that over under. And you, you and I were hemming and hawing at it. I did not end up taking it, but I was like, man, I think they could win 86 games because I thought with a proper pitching staff and we all thought the offense would be good that they would make the playoffs. And I think if if the offense hadn't fallen apart this year you'd like to think they would have won three extra games. I mean, heck, if you look at the wild card, the Braves um, are on the cusp of not making it. They have 88, so you still probably could have been not a playoff team and won those 86 games. Um, But alas, that's where we are. So over-unders were fun this year. Now, as we look towards the playoffs, around August, I started seeing what 
you had mentioned Kansas City to me, and I said, well, I feel like Detroit's a little further along than Kansas City. It turns out we were both right. Um, I don't think you understand how right we are. Do you know what the record for the Kansas City Royals is? It is 86 and 76. Do you know what the record for the Detroit Tigers is? It's 86 and 76. <laughs> They're the same record. There's just tiebreakers involved. So I actually went down and took a little bet, couple bets of my own. Now, I'm also interested in what the San Diego Padres do, and we'll talk about them more in just a second. So I took the role. I do the same kind of thing every playoff season. I pick a team, or in this case, it's going to be two, and I say, I'm going to put, usually it's like 20 bucks on to win the conference or the league, and then 20 bucks to win the, the World Series or the Stanley Cup Final. So I took the Royals with FanDuel. This is in August, and this was a couple days before they had a chance to play the Cleveland Guardians, and they ended up tying them for the division at this point, late, late August. So I was getting my number before. I thought they were going to flip and win the division, and they, at the time, were like four wins from being a second seed division winner. Like, Cleveland's a second seed, so they don't have to play the wild card round. So I thought, plus 800, that's a great number, and that's just to win the pennant. So I put five on it, because I spread my money out a little bit more, so we didn't do the whole 20. Five to win 40, walk away with 45. And then 20 at plus 2,200 to win the whole thing, getting 440 in winnings, 460 out the door. I think Kansas City had a really, really good chance. Now, I'm not as, quite as confident right now because that was before Vinny Pasquantino broke his thumb and their offenses sputtered. But they're going to play Baltimore in the first round, and those two teams, the winner of that, will play the Yankees in the division series. On the National League side, I took San Diego. That was a little, it was a little lesser bet because they, they're having a good year. They're, they almost had a chance to win the division over the Dodgers. But I did this all on the same day. I took the Padres plus 750 with five dollars to win about 37 dollars, 42.50 out the door. And plus 1600, 20 wins me 320, 340 out the door for the World Series. And then I did something really fun. And we've joked about this before. I took for $10, and this was on MGM because FanDuel didn't have this, exact World Series matchup, Padres versus Royals. $10 would get me over $1,000. I'm not going to give you the exact number for finance purposes. But... Let's just say I'm going to have a pretty nice vacation if uh, if that hits. Now, Tim, you were talking about, before we went on air, while we were watching the end of the Mets-Braves game, you were talking to me about a couple of different matchup and postseason ideas that you had. So let's see what you have. Just We're not going to go into numbers yet. That'll be the next thing we talk about. But just from that, things you wanted to look for, tell, me what you were telling, tell them what you were telling me. Um, well... I could go a million different directions with this. Um, the first thing I think about when I'm looking at all of these matchups, if you want to talk betting, uh, a betting side of it, is that, unfortunately, right or wrong, the number one team usually doesn't win. It's usually a wild card team. Um, and so, naturally, in that sense, I'm also getting better odds, better numbers, winning more money for how much I'm placing if I take the underdog um, I like the Mets um, before this game started uh, today um, honestly I watched the whole game and it was three to nothing in the top of the eighth when they took out Schwellenbach and then I came over to Aaron's house and had stopped watching it um, and then he mentioned to me that it was seven to six and I said some things that I'm not going to say on air um, because I was absolutely blown away about the result. Um, I thought the Mets were going to win this game. I didn't think they were going to win it in the way that they did. Um, they're actually a team um, that has uh, – there's a period of time within the season where they have one of the, the best record from that point of any major league team. Um, I think they're a, a surprise, a sleeper. Um the Tigers, the Royals, and the Padres um, are the ones that I'm I'm looking at closely. 
and you mentioned an exact World Series matchup that you would, and from a betting standpoint, again, so I always kind of preface this, people like to talk about, um, maybe more people are involved in the betting world than I think, but a lot of people like to play pick 'em, which is who do you think is going to win? From betting, you're not necessarily playing pick 'em. Uh, I explained to some friends when I took the Royals that I was looking for a nice sweet spot team, a team that wasn't one of the top teams because the payout will be better, but not like the last team in thinking, oh, that, you know, they don't have a good chance, but their m- number is really, really high. Um, so in betting, you're looking for what I like to call the sweet spot, where it's, do you think they can do it, and is there a number that's going to pay you, as opposed to, you know, if you put money on the Yankees, you're not going to either make that much or, you know, on like a night-to-night basis, you're going to have to actually pay more to win less. So I picked Padres, Royals, what is your matchup that you liked for a betting standpoint? Um, well, what I'm looking at at this point is even like I just noticed um, the only series matchup numbers that are out are the Tigers versus Houston and Kansas City versus Baltimore because those are set. Um, and I just noticed those uh, series prices and both the Tigers and the Royals are plus money. They're both plus 155. And honestly, to me, I think either of those teams could win that series. And so it just makes absolute sense. Um, I would not take either of the favorites to win that series. Um, at, could I be completely wrong? Absolutely. Could the Yankees and the Dodgers easily be in the World Series? Um, and anything that I'm about to talk about today is completely wrong? Absolutely. They're both incredible, and their offenses alone could carry them to a pennant. Um, I'm just looking at the history of the wild card and and the way that that just changes things. And you've got that that team that gets hot, that just rolls right through. Um, how many teams? I mean, there's so many teams that have done it. I mean, well, the and- Nats come to mind e- in recent years as an example. And Well, there's another theory out there that people have talked about over the last year or two, and that is it only started in 2022, technically 2020, where we had the wild card series. It used to be a one-game playoff or, you know, if they were just in the playoffs prior to to that. But with the one-game play, wildcard playoff, it didn't mean as much. But there are some teams who think... We'll talk about the Rangers and the Diamondbacks from last year. The Rangers set, were one of the best teams in baseball all year and then struggled down the stretch. And then they said, having to go on the road, best of three, put your best foot forward, really... T- put them back in gear from where they were playing earlier in the year, and they ended up winning the World Series. The Diamondbacks, they got in. They were already fighting for their lives. I don't know. People like to say that, you know, both sides of this coin are true, that, oh, the teams that are in the wild card are already playing, so they're already heated up, and then the teams with the bye, the the top two division winners are getting stale. I don't necessarily believe that because it's the same amount of time we had between Rally Monday, which is technically today, and the division series starting with the one game wild card because it would be played Tuesday and Wednesday and then Thursday or Friday we'd start the division series. Well, we're going to play Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and then Friday or Saturday we're going to start the divi- division series. So I don't think the teams that are resting are necessarily over rested. It always used to be that they would rest for a few days. But teams have said, and the Rangers were very candid about it, having to go to Tampa on the road last year really helped them. We saw the Phillies beat the Cardinals in a wild game one in 22 and then continue that in uh, game two, and then they went to the World Series. So you're talking about these wild card teams. Well, some of them feel like having to go and face that adversity puts them on the same level as these division winners because they're already, they're already having to face challenges. Well, and I think that Detroit, as an example, is one of those teams where they weren't even really a thought. No, they got hot a month late. ago, and they got hot late. I mean, what better team to ride? Their odds are probably one of the worst, if not the worst, in the whole thing. And they're playing really good baseball. They believe that they can beat anybody. And in baseball, that's really, I mean, you, the Mets are kind of the same way on the other the, side. The Mets, um, I like the Padres. I just like the Padres. Um, The things that I'm thinking about looking at are the odds in the series, each series, because um, those odds could 
you know, payoff with the underdog. Um, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of the Braves right now, um, but I believe the Mets can win their series that they're they're going into. Um, and it's an interesting, uh, you know, with the National League, we don't really know yet. I like the Mets and the Padres. Well, they could be facing each other. Well, to me, that seems, uh, if I like both of those teams, to, Ooh, we to have pull some, it off. We have some breaking Braves news. And so my dad had actually... We were talking last night about what was going to happen today, and he said that there had been some hints that maybe Chris Sale is hurt because he, you know, he hasn't pitched in like 14 days. Well, uh, I'm trying to find the newest news. Chris Sale has been scratched from the game two start, so we're talking about the Braves have to win to make the to make the playoffs. They have to win, or their season is over. And the guy who you want on the mound, who they had said he'll play in game two, um, he has been scratched. Grant Holmes is now pitching. He has a 3.78 ERA. I have to see. I do want to take a look at him if he is. I don't. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know. Yeah, he he has started. He has started six games for them. I was like, I was I was blanking out. I was like, is, is are we doing bullpen game? It's going to be it's going to be any type of game. Um, but we do have a lineup. It's Harris, Albies, Ozuna, Olson, Soler, Loriano, Urshela, Murphy, and Arcia. So, same lineup. Murphy's in instead of Darnone. But that is humongous for the Braves because now they were a couple outs away from winning a game, and now they are in a do-or-die, essentially tiebreaker, and they do not have the guy that they want, wanted to start that game. So... Um, our buddy at work, Rob, who's from Arizona, is going to be licking his chops because he's a Diamondbacks fan, and he's been worried about this series all weekend. And Now, having said that, there is no lineup or starting pitcher listed right now for the Mets. That game will start at 3.30 Central Time, 4 th- I'm sorry, 3.40, 4.40 Eastern Time. So we, uh, well, it's a, they probably pushed it a, a few minutes because of the, the other game just started, so... Right now, it, it's that's the listed time, but obviously, they're not going to start immediately. Um, let's see if it says anything on MLB. Yeah, they said they're in. It says they're in the warm up. They're not necessarily starting this instant. Um, Braves lineup has been the uh, Joey Lucchese is starting for the Mets, and they're going uh, the younger Acuna. Marte is DHing. Nimmo is in left. Alonso's at first. Vientos is at third. Tyrone Taylor's in right, Bader is in center, and Torrens is catching, and then Alvarez is second base. So there's a couple of names still in there. They could still win that game and take both. Um, the other aspect is they have 89 wins, and the Diamondbacks have 89 wins, and they are the. I I don't I don't know if they have the tiebreaker or not. We're gonna find out later tonight, but. There's still a determination of are you playing San Diego, who almost had a chance to win the Western Division again over the Dodgers, or do you want to go to Milwaukee, who, no disrespect, but they're not. I don't think they're quite the Padres, so um, that's going to be very interesting. On that note, we will, let's get back on the track that we were on. Um, you and I were talking series. Obviously, the National League wildcard series stuff isn't out right now. Um, I'm actually watching the lines on the game coming up moving. Uh, I'm on FanDuel and I can see like red and green dots are popping up by the odds and by the the spread and everything. Uh, so that'll be that'll be interesting to see how that works out. But let's talk about the AL wildcard series for the moment just because we do have those numbers. Uh, you were talking about the Tigers and the Astros. So I'm on FanDuel right now and the money line says Tigers plus 154 Astros minus 184. Um, yeah, I have uh, I have plus 155. Um, and honestly, uh, I couldn't even... I have to go in here real quick to uh, look at what those uh, odds were because I instantly gravitated towards looking at the odds for the Royals and the Tigers being plus. Um, and as much as they were plus, um, that... I can't even tell you off the top of my head what the favorite was because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go that route. That's not who I would even think about uh, 
think about doing. Now to um, copy you on that, the Royals Orioles Royals are plus 144 on here and minus 172 for Baltimore. These are interesting matchups because, first of all, Houston is a division winner. I don't think they're quite as good as they've been the last few years, but is quick aside, is Houston is Houston inevitable? I mean, they've been good. For, I said this in my first segment. Aside from the cheating scandal, they still win. Um, they obviously know how to do things there, and the cheating helped them, but they were already a good team. How... Are are you on board with this idea? Like the Astros are, you got to count them in until you count them out. The Astros, with the way that they played, um, if you were gonna, outside of the teams that I've talked about, that I'm probably gonna put a, a little money on um, to win everything. If you said who's the one team that you haven't said anything about, you're leaving them alone, but could be the one to do it it's the Astros and that's because they started off the season in a way that we had never seen the Astros play in a very 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 long time they were horrible one of the worst teams in baseball to start the year and the way that they turned it around to easily take that division and and the the way that they played once they once they figured it out um, you could honestly say that they're one of the better teams from that point probably record wise um in the whole thing so you can never count the astros out they have experience they have guys that have been there before i mean they actually lost 15 games in april and at one point lost five in a row including games to washington and chicago the cubs not the white Sox, but still they lost to kansas city early they lost to the they were swept by the braves um, they lost two to the Texas Rangers, who ended up getting uh, hurt a lot this year. So, yeah, I, I see what you mean by the Astros, and they're just, they always seem to be there. Now, meanwhile, Baltimore, I kind of talked about earlier, they were in a race with the Yankees for that division till the bitter end, but they've lost a lot of their rotation. You know, Bradish went out. They got Means back briefly, and they lost him. They've got Corbin Burns, so they have the guy. Like, the Yankees have Cole, but they've also got X, Y, and Z. The Orioles have Burns, but then they had to trade for Zach Eflin, and um, they they don't have the rest of their regular rotation. So while the Orioles are a really good lineup and a good team, it's going to be really interesting to see if they can survive. Now, the Rangers did this last year, though. The Rangers had Evaldi and Montgomery, but they didn't have Scherzer. They didn't have DeGrom. They didn't have uh, John Gray. They went into the wild card series with essentially three starting pitchers and then just used them all over again. They, well, they had Dane Dunning, but they had like three, two or three and a half starting pitchers. So the Orioles, there's, there's a way for the Orioles to prevail, but it's going to be tough. Now, they're playing the Royals who have been a little bit banged up. And we actually do have some pitching matchups for that already. Let's look at tomorrow. Um, Reagans is going to face Corbin Burns. So it's not Seth Lugo, but it's me, Cole Reagans. That's who the Royals have decided on. It's kind of obvious for the, for the Orioles side. The Orioles have not announced a Game 2 starter. Guessing it's going to be Eflin. Um, Seth Lugo will pitch Game 2 for the Royals. And if necessary... Michael Waka will face TBD uh, for game number three. Let me see who else is listed in their potential rotation for the Orioles. I, I just want to have the information because Bradish is out. Uh, Dean Kramer. Dean Kramer has been the other guy who could be in their rotation. The Tigers-Astros series has been announced through one game. Uh, they are going to start with Skubal and Valdez. We do not know who's going to pitch game two for either of those teams at this point. So I don't really have any major predictions. I mean, I'd like to see Kansas City move on, obviously because I'm jumping on their bandwagon because I'm betting on them. Side note, that's a really great stadium, and if anybody has a chance to go to the to uh, Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, it's fantastic with the fountains, but also so is Baltimore. Um, this is a bad, like, the, the two American League matchups, I've never been to Houston I've been to Detroit, Baltimore, and Kansas City, and all three of those are great ballparks to uh, visit. 
on the National League side, the Brewers are hosting and the Padres are hosting. And those are the night games, by the way. The first game tomorrow is going to be the Astros. The second game is going to be Orioles. Then the Brewers and the Padres. And that's at 6.30 and 7.30. So those are going to be around the same times. Uh, but the first two games at 1 and 3 o'clock, a little more spread out. So we'll see what happens with this Braves uh, and Diamondbacks to round out the National League. If you look at the American League bracket, so we're going to focus a little more on that because obviously we know all the teams. You know, in the National League, you could say the Phillies, the Padres, the Dodgers are all heavyweights, but, you, you know, Tim and I both think you can't rule out with how the Mets have played for about two months now. And honestly, I think the Diamondbacks can get going because they've gotten healthier, and they do have some good pitchers. The Braves are the ones that would scare... If I'm a Braves fan, in the National League... That's probably the team that scares me the most um, to not succeed. They're they're banged up, and you know we've seen them do be- do well. But they won twenty one when they were banged up, so you can't really count anyone out. But the teams I'm kind of looking at keyholing are the Phillies, Bra- uh, Phillies, Dodgers, and Padres, and seeing how the Mets perform. Again, I'm not trying to you know poo poo the Brewers, but this kind of sets up like they did for them last year where. They got in and they didn't really perform. They were the NL Central Division winner, and that division is just not as high as it once was. So, uh, American League side, though, you know, you were talking about Houston and Detroit. Well, they get to go play Cleveland, and all due respect to Cleveland, I view them a little bit different than Milwaukee, but it's not the Yankees. So, if you're looking at that Tigers Astro series, going, okay, who can get to the World Series out of that side, and I believe it does stick with um, bracket format. It doesn't just reseed. So Cleveland will host the division series against Houston or Detroit. That's that's the side you want to, you probably want to be on in terms of the the division series. Royals Orioles versus the Yankees. That'll be fun just because the Yankees have been so good. But I think a lot of the world probably wants to see Orioles Yankees just because of how that division has gone. Don't don't rule out what Kansas City could do against the Yankees. Um, you got anybody on this side? That you, you still now we're playing a little bit of pick 'em as opposed to betting for this like this this comment here. But who do you like on the American League side? Just I think this team's going to the World Series. Well, I mean, if you're if if I'm just going to think logically and I'm going to take the numbers and the odds out of it, um, I'm going to look at that and say the New York Yankees. Um, But I also am going to look at that numbers aside and say the Detroit Tigers because they're one of the hottest teams in baseball. And if they can keep that momentum, um, you know, they they have a good little solid ball club. And if they can keep that momentum going, um, I think they could easily be the darling and the surprise that everybody's talking about. Um, at the end of October, um, I mean, could any one of those teams do the whole do it? Yes, um, but those are the two that I would look at. Um, and the, if you want to add the betting side to it, the Tigers. I mean, that's just for the bang for your buck, for the fact that I can take some lunch money that doesn't mean anything to me, and uh, come out ahead if they were to really pull it off. Um, you know. That's that's where it's at for me. That's no questions asked. I mean, the odds of me being right are very, very slim. But if I am, I'm dancing in my living room. So on that note, I'm looking at the American League League winners page on FanDuel. Obviously, Yankees, Guardians, Astros, Orioles, Royals, and Tigers. Tigers are clocking in at plus 1,100. And then again, I always like to explain this. Uh, for those who don't follow betting, if I bet $100 on a plus uh, $1,100 bet, I'm going to walk away with uh, $1,200, my original bet and the $1,100 that I win. Conversely, if it was minus, I would have to bet that $1,100 to win $100. Obviously, in futures, everything is generally plus 100 or plus money as opposed to minus money. Uh, so the Tigers have the best plus money of the American League teams. Royals are next with plus a thousand. Orioles are at plus fifty-five, 
it's plus 550. It's not even 5,500. It's plus 550. There's a huge drop-off because the Orioles almost won a division. Astros plus 370. Guardians plus 320. Yankees plus 180. So they're right along with you. The, the Yankees are the... This team's probably going if you were to just take things on face value. And the Tigers are the lunch money. They are... They, they will get you something if they make the World Series. Now, in the National League, we actually still have the odds for all of the teams, including the Diamondbacks. Dodgers are plus 165. So the Dodgers are actually worse odds to make the World Series than the Yankees. Um, I have the verbiage right. right? Better, well, better. They're, they're, they're better they have odds. the best odds, the, but the worst odds in the sense of payout yes for, and betting and that yeah so they are most likely to make the world series they the dodgers are the most likely team in the betters eyes to make the world series but they are going to pay you the least the phillies are next at plus 175 then the padres at plus 600 so that's 200 worse than i did i had the plus that's 800 a, that's a big drop off from those two teams and then we're going to get into the brewers plus a thousand mets are currently plus 1200 and again the Mets, Braves, and Diamondbacks are unfinished because there's still this game to be played, and I don't officially know where the Mets are going to fall, whether they're going to and who they're going to play, and that will change it. So even though the Mets are in, when we officially know who they're playing, you know, and if you know what happens if Pete Alonso breaks his hand in this game, which I don't think they're going to let happen, they'll take him out at some point. But if if the Mets have an injury in this game that they're playing right now, that'll change their odds too. Braves are plus 1,400, and the Diamondbacks are plus 2,300. So if you're out there going, you know, I think the Mets are going to win this because of the Chris Sale thing, and the Diamondbacks are going to get in. And they went to the World Series as the last team in last year, and they still have a good rotation. They can make the World Series. Your odds to just make the World Series if you're a Diamondbacks fan are plus 2,300. So you could, on a fluke, make something off of that. Now on to the World Series. Winning the World Series... Diamondbacks are plus 4,500. Tigers are th- and Royals are plus 3,000. Braves are actually ahead of them at plus 2,700. Brewers plus 2,000. Mets plus 1,600. Orioles 13. Uh, Guardians 1,100. Padres 950. Astros 850. Yankees 450. Phillies plus 380. And Dodgers plus 350. So the people who keep the book at FanDuel are saying... We like the Dodgers and the Phillies to win the World Series over the Yankees. And then it gets to the Astros. Um, that's funny because even the Guardians, who won a division, they get a bye. The Guardians get a bye into the division series, and the Astros, who have to play the wild card, their number isn't isn't as good. So they think the Astros are even more likely than the Guardians, and that is history. That's uh, The Astros just know how to win. So, you know... That's that. You also have uh, people out there that are actually uh, in different places making these bets um, that are changing these odds. And, I mean, uh, how many more people, because of history, are putting money on the Astros over the Guardians because they've proven that they can do it regardless. All you got to do is get into the playoffs. Um, But that's, you know, that is definitely, that moves the number. And now I'm starting to look at the uh, mattress. The, Mac hasn't probably made his million dollar bet yet, but I'm no, sure. He, I'll be but I'm sure about he will. That. <laughs> I'm actually starting to look at the exact number, and I'm queuing up my betting odds calculator. So the number that I got for Padres and Royals to play in the World Series together uh, got me over a thousand. Well, now it is. Nope, I lost my page. There it is. Plus 7,500 for those two. So where I was getting like 100,000 plus 100,000 or 10,000 or whatever, plus 7,500 now. So those odds have changed. That's probably some of that is because they've made the playoffs and, you know, I, we were making bets before they clinched. So there was a chance they didn't make the playoffs still. And the Padres have gotten better. So everything, everything comes down once you make the playoffs. You know, I looked at that last year when I made my bets on the Rangers, and they did cash. I took Rangers to win the pennant in the World Series. I was making a bet like the last two weeks of the season when they were kind of slumping because I was like, I'm going to take advantage of this. 
Uh, the Royals, I did it a little further out because I thought their arrow was pointing up. They had a chance to win the division, and actually they fell off, but the Padres got better. What you are talking about, though, uh, right now is CLV, closing line value. And naturally, um, you know, my odds on the Kansas City Royals at the beginning of the season to win the World Series, if only um, because no one even thought they'd be in the playoffs. So the odds that you would have gotten at the beginning of the year um, are, is a lot better than the closing line that we're at now for the end of the season. Um, so you actually were able to, even though plus 7,500 is a very good payout, you actually even beat that number um, uh, from the closing line. That closing line on that going into the playoffs is 7,500. Well, you beat that number by getting better odds at, at plus 10,000 or wherever it was that you got it at um, because you had the guts to look at that uh, before the season even ended and you even knew if they were going to make it to the playoffs. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that's one of the things that um, even if, you know, we're not talking about amounts of money. We, you know, neither of us are talking about amounts of money that are going to mean anything to us. We're just having some fun, yeah. trying to get, trying to make some predictions and, and get some things right and, and have a little have a have a, have a good time and entertain ourselves with the playoffs and have something to root for, and and you uh, you know you actually uh, you know had the guts to do that and uh, it'll pay off handsomely if you're right. Yeah, and I uh, you know it's. I wish I could say, well, I put 20 bucks on my Cardinals to win the World Series this year, but I didn't. Um, we've had a couple, we've had a couple of down years. I knew better. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, I, well, I didn't put money on them to win the World Series, and I didn't even have you put money on them for uh, to make the playoffs. I just thought they'd have a winning record, and I was right about that. I just didn't. I wouldn't have cashed the over under I was looking at, but somewhere maybe that 83 was hanging around there. 82, 83, 500 record. Uh, but here's another little fun conversation I'll have with you. I've been having this conversation with some of my um, ex-followers, former Twitter. I put a poll out, and I said, you know, it's I've always believed, you and I are a little bit different here, but you also aren't. You just say it in a different way. I've always believed that as long as you know who your number one, your real team is, it's okay to have two things, a second favorite team. So, like, I'm a Cardinals fan. I'm also a Red Sox fan. Like, I've been a fan of them almost my whole life. I'm a definitely a Cardinal fan, and I root against the Red Sox every time the Cardinals play them, and I root for the Cardinals in the World Series. But as you play fantasy baseball and you bet on sports, you start to latch on to sometimes players and sometimes teams that you're taking an interest in for other reasons. So, like, last year I visited Texas, and I went to a couple of Rangers games, and I latched on to them, and it was fun. I wouldn't call myself like a permanent fan of theirs, but I enjoyed watching them, and I really, really hoped that they would win in October. And I also had a couple other players for fantasy baseball. This year, that would be the case for the Royals. I went on a road trip, saw the Cardinals at the Royals. Um, I'm also a Chiefs fan, so I appreciate some elements of Kansas City. There's a Now, what's interesting about the Royals is a lot of Cardinal fans don't like them because of the 85 World Series and like the in-state rivalry. But I'm pulling for the Royals to win uh, this year. I know you've always said that you don't really have second favorite teams. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having a second favorite team or feeling like you shouldn't. But is there someone that you are throwing on the temporary baseball cap for this well, year? And it happens in, in every sport for me every year. Um, whether it's the NFL, whether it's the NBA, um, college basketball, college football, um, NHL, MLB. Um I have my teams that I am a fan of first and foremost and will never root against them regardless of who they're playing, and that's first, and that will never change. Um, and that's in every sport. Um, but every season there are these teams um, that just, I don't know what it is or why it is for me, but uh, they do something to me. Um, and so every year in every sport I'll, I'll end up having a team, and that changes from year to year. Um, you know, when my team's not there, I have a team where it's okay. If my team's not going to win it, I'm going to root for these guys. Um, and this year in baseball, 
It absolutely, at this point, happens to be the Detroit Tigers. Um, I actually decided, um, I can't even, I, I actually looked it up the other day, but I can't remember the dates of uh, the Cardinals were in Detroit this year. Um, and I decided on a Tuesday night after working all day to literally get in my car, in my work clothes, and, uh, and drive to Detroit. I actually took a shower and changed out of my work clothes in the hotel in downtown Detroit after driving six straight hours there. And I woke up the next day and I see my Cardinals get beat four to one by the Tigers. But I got to see the city. Fantastic. Absolutely. I recommend it for anyone. Uh, Detroit's a good town. Um, and going to the ballpark, any new ballpark is amazing. And now that team is the little darling that's, you know, got on fire and then now they're headed into the playoffs. So hands down, they're, they're the team I'm going to be I'm going to be rooting for this year, and the Padres. I, from the beginning of the season, um, I liked them. Um, the other thing, usually I'll, I'll admit I kind of gravitate towards towards the team that hasn't been there in a while, um, you know, that hasn't won one yet. Um, well, and the Tigers qualify for that. We, I mentioned that in my earlier segment how uh, if the, the Royals haven't been there since 2015 when they won the World Series – well, the Tigers haven't been there since 2014 when the Orioles beat them in the division series to go on and play said Kansas City Royals. Um, yeah, I, I actually didn't even realize that the Tigers had been to the to the playoffs that recently. Um, so I, that actually surprises me. Um, I know the Padres have never won one before. Um, honestly, I don't know who I'd root. I, I honestly, I probably root for the Padres. If, if it came down to the Padres and the and the Tigers, I don't know. It'd be hard to not root for the Padres because I've never done it. Well, and um, they got Mike Schilt, yeah, former well, Cardinal yeah, manager, yeah, which which is kind of kind of uh, kind of ironic because that's pretty much all the Cardinal fans do nowadays is is look at the teams and the players that they have and and the managers that they have and how well they've done. And you think to yourself, oh well, if we would have just kept all of these players and the manager. We might be the team in the World Series, but that's also one of the reasons why I won a little extra money this year because, yes, I took the Cardinals not to make the playoffs. I bet on my own team at the beginning of the season not to make the playoffs, hoping I would lose that, but logically I thought to myself, here's some easy money, and I was right. For those of you who don't know, the Padres manager, Mike Schilt, he was the Cardinals manager after Mike Matheny, and he took them to the NLCS in 2019, his first full season. They made the playoffs in the COVID-shortened season of 2020, despite losing a bunch of players early. Um, they made a crazy comeback in 21 to go to the wild card game, and then in 22, they moved on from him. They actually moved on from him in 21, right after the wild card game, citing philosophical differences. The nudge, nudge, wink, wink about that is that he managed old school by gut and he didn't like the analytics book kind of dictating what he was going to do. And the Cardinals have started to get into all of that as a lot of baseball teams have and they wanted to do that. So the, phys- the philosophical differences were how to manage in the dugout. And San Diego and a couple other teams, like including the Giants who hired Bob Melvin, have gone more towards, well, we're going to use these analytics as a tool, not for the roadmap, and let the manager do their job. Well, that means the philosophical differences were uh, winning. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious at this point. Um, and San Diego is a, is a team um, that I think has just as good a chance as, as any of them. I think, I think they're really solid. And my, my exacta that... Um, you know, there's only one team different in, in my exacta to make the the World Series that I'm uh, going to probably take, and that's uh, the Tigers and the Padres, um, uh, just because that, you know, I'm not going to win that. But man, <laughs> you oh never man, know. But, but man, I mean, that's the thing. You don't know. That's the beauty of it. That's the fun of it. That's the excitement of it. We're headed into October baseball. And you have no clue. Any of these team, people, and every year, it, it's always the team that you just don't expect gets it done. So what do I want to have my moolah on? If I'm going to go ahead and take $10 and put it on something, it's going to be something that's going to really, really, really make my day. And 
the Tigers and the Padres in the World Series, one, it would be awesome, and two, that would, I mean, that would, I'd be dancing. I'd be more than dancing in my living room. I always tell people, you know, our team is out. I'd frame that ticket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> our, our team is out. I always take a picture after mine wins because, I, you know, they take it from you. But our team is out, but... As a baseball fan, there's always something to cheer for. There's, it's always fun to watch the playoffs. There's former players. You know, Xander Bogarts, who's one of my favorite Red Sox, he's on the Padres. And Tommy Edmond, one of your favorite recent Cardinals, is on the Dodgers. And, you know, Bobby Witt's an upstanding guy. Jackson Holiday is on the Orioles. I mean, you can name all sorts. You know, I, was, I wasn't completely against the Astros a couple years ago. Okay, I'd like to see you guys do it legit. I don't really want to root for you, but... I would appreciate if you guys could win one in a legitimate sense, uh, and they did. You know, Cleveland, I have a friend, or my uh, former host for uh, the radio station here, he's from Cleveland, and he's a big Guardians fan. I, You know, if they win, I'll be thinking about him. I'm not really happy with Cleveland for, you know, falling to the Cubs a few years ago. That didn't help anyone around here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's there's good – in Philadelphia, they've been working for a few years – so there's good stories all around baseball. Um, I've picked my teams, the the Royals and the Padres. Tim's interested in the Royals. He's interested in the Tigers. That's from a betting standpoint and just a storyline standpoint. Um, and, you know, frankly, if the Dodgers, Phillies, or Yankees win, there's as much as people root against some of the high-spending teams, there's good things to look at for them too. You never really want your rival to win, but even when the Cubs won, I had friends who were Cub fans, so... We'll see how October unfolds. Um, I'm going to keep you around for one more segment. We're going to get into just a little bit of hockey talk because we just had a fantasy hockey draft last night. This is kind of an unplanned segment, but it's going to be. We'll we'll give a few minutes talking about you know where the Blues are going to be at this year, and you know maybe there's some team that we just think, oh yeah, they should be good this year. Well, it's a good thing I randomly went over some of the point totals for the teams and who I like for this season and kind of some directions I'm going in last night because I really like all of a sudden I I have something to talk about too. All right, so we'll be right back. here. This is Strauss Net Sports Radio, MLB Postseason Edition. Welcome back to Strauss Net Sports Radio. We've been talking MLB Postseason Let's change gears for one final segment because you and I are both insane and huge hockey fans. We're both St. Louis Blues fans. I told Tim he's a uh, a strange Blues fan because he learned about the Blues the year they won the Stanley Cup before they went on that crazy run where they ended up making the playoffs. So it wasn't like they won and then he became a fan. He was a fan for the very end of the bad, you know, the turmoil, and then all of a sudden, a few months later, they went on this crazy run to make the playoffs, and then they win the Stanley Cup. So Tim is now a hockey fan. I have him doing fantasy hockey with me. We are actually in a really kind of extreme uh, head-to-head league that's drafting tomorrow, and we'll see how that goes. But we got into a little bit of NHL futures. Uh, The first thing we'll talk about is our St. Louis Blues. The Blues, a couple years ago... Had a chance in 22, had a chance in the playoffs to go maybe all the way to the Stanley Cup, but fizzled out against Colorado, who eventually won. They were just better than everyone, not to mention the injury that Nazem Kadri caused to Jordan Bennington. But the Blues, they fell to a superior team either way. But that was a really good team. And then the net last couple of years, they've kind of fallen off. And here's the difference between the Cardinals and the Blues the Cardinals have no real salary cap. They have a, a luxury tax for payroll if they need if they get that high. But the Blues have a salary cap. They can't go over it. So as the salary cap got up there, they had to make decisions. They lost guys like David Perron. They have to pay certain people. And so they decided, we're going to take a couple steps backwards to take a couple steps forward. So the last couple of years, they have let some older guys go and brought in some younger guys. Let some younger guys come up to their system, like Jake Neighbors. This past offseason, they had Broberg and Holloway on restricted free agent offer sheets from Edmonton, and they got them both. Craig Berube is out. I was, uh, I'm disappointed in that decision last year because I still like him, but they bring Drew Bannister in. And last year there were some things I didn't like about Bannister, but I'm going to give him a shot. He seems to be having a good training camp. He's in positive spirits. The players seem to really like it. Um, 
I think they liked Barubi, but everything I've heard from Blue's training camp is that they really like how prepared they feel with Drew Bannister, and they know all the plays. So, you know, we're going to see. So the Blues inherently got better from some continuity. You know, when you change coaches and systems in hockey partway through a season, it's just a little different. And they're going to rely on some of their younger talent. They re-signed Pavel Buchnevich. Um, you know, they had these two young guys. They had Radek Faxa, who's going to be uh, more of a power play special, penalty kill specialist, penalty kill. And Jordan Bennington and Joel Hofer are still there in net. They have two good goalies. So our St. Louis Blues were a team that barely missed the playoffs last year. And Tim, you and I, I think, both agreed when we were off the air that Blues are going back to the playoffs, and especially at plus 210. Yeah, that's uh, that's good odds, and uh, it's kind of fun this year for me because I, I legitly um, think that the Blues could be that little surprise team. Um, I'm hoping, of course, naturally. Um, but, you know, just like I said with, with the Cardinals, I mean, my, I didn't think they were going to make the playoffs. Um, and so I wasn't afraid to, to put a little on that. And, well, in the, when it comes to the hockey season, um, I think they're – their point total of 85 and a half. Um, their their point total of 85 and a half. Um, I think they can they can beat that and they can go over that. And I think that plus 210 is very very good value on a, on a team that could surprise everybody this year in in the NHL. Now you said so. You said plus 210 for them to make the playoffs. Their 85 and a half was our over and under number. And they had 99 points last year, folks. Let me just double check that because it sounds crazy that they. A lot of people say you know 100 points is maybe the. You were asking me, you know, because you're still new to hockey standings. What's what's a 500 team? And we were saying like 80 points is about your 500. It's a it's an 82 game schedule. Well, there's the math for you. Duh, I overthought it. If it's an 82 game schedule, and you win half your games, and each point for a win is two points. You're going to get a point to game pace. 80 points is your 500 team. I feel stupid now having thought of that. They were 90. I'm sorry. They didn't have 99. That was Nashville, who we'll talk about in a minute. 92 for the Blues. Behind Nashville in the Central Division. Um, so they were 1, 2, 3, 4. They were fifth in the Central with 92 points. 99, 98 actually got you in. Vegas had 98. They were the last team in in the West. Uh, in the East... No, the Washington Capitals got in with 91. The Red Wings had 91. But everyone was kind of like 98 and up. So we're saying the Blues 85 and a half, and this is points. Um, yeah, they're going to be a 90-point team. They're better. Inherently, they're better than they were last year. And if the Blues hadn't sucked in October and November and gotten Craig Berube fired, they'd have easily had almost 100 points last year. So just for the sake of they're a better team and everything's on the same page this year, they're going to get to 90 points. Another team that we talked about was the Detroit Red Wings. I said they had 91 points. Well, they added Tarasenko. They signed Cam Talbot. they kind of been going through goalies uh, the last couple of years. They had Alex Lyon get hot last year. Um, Billy Husso, former Blues goalie, had been signed a couple of years ago. So they think Talbot's now going to be their starter and then, but they still got Huso and Lyon. For fantasy players, that's a little bit of a nightmare because you got three guys potentially. But for a hockey team, they're going to find a guy and roll with them. You had Tarasenko. They brought Patrick Kane back. They've still got DeBrinket. Uh, Comfer had a good year. Oh, and Dylan Larkin and Lucas Raymond, who are their Batman and Robin, they're still there. And Moritz Sider is only a year older. So Detroit playoffs, yes, was plus 155. And you and I both said, oh, yes, absolutely. They only met, they missed by they tied with the Capitals. They needed one more point. So you're saying can the Detroit Red Wings get above the hump? I think so. Um, and that number at plus 155 um, is a very very good value for a team that just barely missed it last year. Um, their win total of 90 and a half. Um, it it absolutely makes sense for that to be over um, as well. And the thing I like about it the most is it's sitting right now juiced to the under to where I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you're getting plus money to take the Red Wings over 90.5 points. And that, to me, just financially makes more sense. In theory, there are different, a little bit different points, but in theory the Red Wings are actually ahead of where the Blues were. The Red Wings had to rebuild. The Blues had to retool. But if you look at them... 
the Red Wings young players are now getting to their primes and they have players like Dabrinkit, Kane, Tarasenko. The Blues are maybe where the Red Wings were last year where they have their young players kind of taking the lead and at some point maybe they will add another Ryan O'Reilly type player back when they added O'Reilly. So if you're saying that the Blue, we think the Blues can be a playoff team, well why not the Red Wings cuz they're ahead of they're ahead of that pace. Yeah, you said plus 100 for the over, minus 130 for the under the Red Wings. I don't think they're under 90 wins. Um Let's look at another couple of teams. We both kind of talked about, you'd mentioned Chicago at 74 and a half points. Last year, the Blackhawks had 52 points. Now, my immediate response was, oh, they'll be better than last year just by virtue of adding a couple of players. But you still think they're not a 75-point team. Um, for reference, Arizona, now Utah, had 77. And I mentioned another team in there. I said Ottawa had 78. So you think that while the Blackhawks will be better... You just don't think they're getting to that. I don't think they're going to be over twenty some points better. And am I am I going to run out and immediately make that play? The Chicago that that under that I like, I might leave it alone. I might you know, There's quite a few things that we're going to. I usually choose two, three at the most when it comes to a futures play like this. Um, so I'll put up a, a, quite a few that I like in the hat here, seven or eight. Um, and then and weed through them as I as I talk about them and get more information and make my final decision on what I'm actually going to put my money on. Um, but there's no way that I'm going to take the Blackhawks over 74 and a half when they only had 52 points last year. Could the could I be wrong? Yeah, but do I don't just I don't see them being that much better. Let's keep going down our list. We have the L.A. Kings who had. I believe it was 99 points last year. And you and I both think that they're probably in the same neighborhood, but not necessarily quite as good. Uh, their number is 96 and a half. You think they can go under that, but their under is actually the the one, the one worst number. Well, I mean, from a betting standpoint, yes, the under is juiced to minus 125. Um, am I looking ultimately um, for the value, whereas an example, I really, really like Detroit's over nine ninety and a half, and it's at plus one hundred, so I get even money. Like that's incredible. But I really like LA's point total under, and sometimes you just gotta pay the juice because that's where it's at. And as an example, with them, um, you know, is it is it juiced heavier? Am I gonna have to put a little more money down? To win, yes, but when I think it's something that I'm confident about, I'm going to be willing to do that. Uh, the next one we have is Nashville. Nashville had an interesting team because they have they added Ryan O'Reilly last year, and there was a lot of people who wondered if Ryan O'Reilly was just simply running out of gas, and he had a really good year, and they've gotten better, and their number is at 101.5. Yeah. So you think they're going to break the 101 barrier? I See, that's one where... And this is what I find interesting, and why it's so important to you know shop around, look at different different sites. You know, each place might have different numbers, um, and so it's very very important to get the best best value. Um, if you give me like I Nashville was one I was really really heavy on, really really liked it, but that number of one hundred one and a half gives me pause. You give me a number of 98 or 99 for Nashville, and I'm all over it because I think they're a 100-win team. But that 100 and a half, 101 and a half, gives me pause because they could easily be 100 or 101. So that might be one that I really, really loved that ultimately with that number being where it is, I might shy away from and just go ahead and leave it alone because I think there's value, better value for my money in other places with other teams. That's kind of like what I had said during the baseball futures that I, you know, I would go against, and it doesn't match up one for one, but I would go under on a hundred win teams. Now hundred win teams for baseball is like your 110, 120 point teams in hockey. It's just, it doesn't match up a hundred points for a hundred wins, but Nashville's not a team that I necessarily, I'm going to say, Oh yeah, a hundred. I, I don't know. Are, is Nashville one of the elite teams? Because getting a lot above 100 would be when you're getting to that higher echelon. So that's hard to see. But on the other end of the spectrum, 
Um, not hard to see, like, I can't see Nashville being good, but, like, I, it's hard to predict if somebody like a Nashville, who's seen more as a mid-market team, um, can they get over that 100 points? On the other side, we were looking for who could be the worst team in hockey, and there's kind of a blatantly obvious one, unfortunately. Um, moment of silence for Johnny Gaudreau and his friends and family. The Columbus Blue Jackets lost their best player. There's no way around it. They're at 66 and a half points. Last year, they had 66 points. I can't see them being better than they were unless they go make some sort of addition. It's just a bad situation, and we're not trying to take advantage of anything. But if, you know, when Tim asked me who you I think the worst team is, and I looked at, I looked at the standings first. I didn't just jump on Columbus, but when I saw Columbus was one of them, it's really hard not to say one of the worst teams in hockey isn't going to be just as bad because it's just... It just is what it is. So they're 115, minus 115 both ways. So we're probably shooting the under here. Um, Montreal was one that you mentioned that there's a lot of people out there. This is sort of a, this is a, a phenomenon and we don't know how to read it necessarily. So Montreal last year had 76 points. Their number is 77 and a half. The under is minus 105. The over is minus 125. Are you, you said that there are some betters out there taking the minus 125 over 77 and a half wins for Montreal. Well, um, in the world that I'm uh, living in when it comes to the things that I'm looking at, it's it's different than just who's going to, you know, be the best team and things like that. So one of the little things that I've found interesting as I've done research over the last couple of weeks is I keep getting these people that I trust in these circles who are throwing out this Canadians to make the playoffs at plus 700 and their, their team total over everyone thinks that they've, they've really improved in the off season. And that is, um, that that's your home run ticket per se. The team that is not very good. That hasn't been very good. That will be the biggest surprise um, from what I've looked at um, going into this season, the Canadians are everyone's little darling to turn, you know, a hundred bucks into seven hundred, or so on, and so forth, or whatever you're trying to trying to do ten into seventy, um, because their odds to make the playoffs um, don't even show up in the app that I looked at compared to some of these other teams, um, and you're going to get a huge payout if they could pull that off, and. You know, and if if that many people um, in the world that I'm looking for my information in are like them to make the playoffs, well, then 77 and a half to the over looks pretty solid as well. We're going to make one final uh, prediction. We threw out some team names that we think, and this is kind of betting aside. It's like I said, it's different when you're playing pick 'em rather than betting on value. So in the pick 'em world, Stanley Cup champions, you said Dallas. And this is money money and betting aside. You said you like Dallas. Um, I said I liked the New York Rangers. I liked them last year, and I thought, man, if they didn't do it last year, when are they going to do it? Because that was about as good as they were going to get. But they're kind of the same team going into this year. And I think if they're going to do it, this may still be their last chance. We also talked about Florida, who, yeah, they lose, they lose Tarasenko, but they're still pretty darn good. Their window is still wide open. Colorado, they should get Landeskog back. My concern with Colorado is they don't have the goaltending they did when they won. Um, maybe they do. I mean, Kemper wasn't that exciting, in my opinion. And then they went out and got Georgiev. So maybe Colorado can do it anyway. Uh, the Drouin addition was good for them. And then how can you not leave out Edmonton? We'd pick the first four, and then I was like, I can't leave Edmonton out. They were so good. They've got all these players. You still think they could get over the hump. Um Toronto, it would be my sixth to throw in there because I just think eventually they're gonna they're gonna eventually do it. They got through the first round this year and then they just kind of fell apart. But I just gotta think Toronto. So I'm saying Dallas, New York, Toronto, Florida, Colorado, and Edmonton. Um, throw me some thoughts there on the Stanley Cup, Tim. Well, I mean, for me, um, I, you know, I, Dallas. 
Um, Colorado and Florida are the, are the first three teams that come to mind. Um, I mean, you could go out and, and throw 10 bucks at, on any one of them at the beginning of the season, and, and two of them are plus 1,000, one's at plus 1,100 to win the Stanley Cup. So even if you, know, if you hit one of those, you're, you're not disappointed in those results. Um, I think two teams um, that I'm not saying anything about uh, that are elite that I'm probably not even going to do anything with um, and could regret are the New Jersey Devils and the Edmonton Oilers. That easily could be your Stanley Cup. I'm matchup. not ready to give up on Boston yet either. I know they had a lot. The lot of the knock on Boston was they were the, these, this regular season team and they got knocked off the last couple of years. And they, you know, they had the two goalie system and could you do it in the playoffs and would you rotate or would you have the one? Well, now they have Swayman and they traded Allmark. So we're going to find out. I still think Boston's pretty good, but. You know, that, that's some hockey talk for you. We think our Blues are going to be better. We think some of the usual sp- suspects will be good. It'll be interesting to see who um, who jumps in. We got one hockey draft down. We both think we did pretty well. We got one to go tomorrow. Completely different style. Last night was year-long. Tomorrow is head-to-head. Um, tomorrow's is crazy because they give us... For any of you who play fantasy sports, usually you're used to having a bench spot. The league we're in tomorrow, there is no bench. Your roster is active. So if you want a bench spot, you're playing short. So I've I carried three goalies last year to have an extra goalie, um, and I went a defenseman short. I think this year I'm going to do it in reverse. I'm going to because you and I made the playoffs a couple of years ago running that system. So I tried it for myself. I think this year I, maybe I'll go with just the two goalies, and then I can. It's called streaming, folks. When you pick up a new player every day, maybe I'll use that last defenseman spot for whatever I need instead of just leaving it open. But that's neither here nor there. This has been Tim Bradshaw. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our show today. I'm going to give us one last update on how the baseball game is going because I have not looked while we've been talking. Let's see how that Braves and Mets game is going. It is actually one nothing Braves in the top of the fifth. The Mets have two on, though, with two out. So we'll see how that goes. We hope you all enjoy the baseball playoffs. If you're betting, please bet smart. Um, and we'll have you on again later. We'll see. Maybe I'm not going to predict when just because, you know, I thought I'd have one around the all-star break and the, the busier I get, the, the less I seem to do. Uh, but we'll try to get back at this quicker than, you know, beginning of hockey season to end of hockey season. Um, but just in case I don't see you, you have a great uh, holiday season and enjoy the playoffs. And I, you will hear from me when you hear from me. Thanks for coming on today, Tim. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. This has been StraussNet Sports Radio, and we will see you next time. Mommy's all right, daddy's all right, they just seem a little weird. Surrender, surrender, but don't give